disclaimer, there is no trunk or treat today. Okay? That's in your bulletins, but eh, false. Uh, however, we are going to have communion today, right? Okay? Uh, so that'll be after the second service. Uh, Friday and Saturday, this coming Friday and Saturday, Small Church Enrichment Conference. And that will be Friday 7 to 9, Saturday 9 to 3.30. Uh, you, they have a website, Barnabas Enrichment Ministries, and you can go on there and see the content of the, of the workshop. Uh, if you can go, I encourage you to do so. There's no charge. Uh, they would like you to pre-register if you can. I'd say you have to do that pretty quick, though. Um, Sunday, November 27th, will be Family Day, carrying dinner. Uh, that's actually, we call that rerun Sunday, because that's when all the Thanksgiving leftovers come in. <laughs> uh, restroom update. Uh, they poured the slab Friday. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, in fact, a very active week. They got the meter moved and... Uh, uh, roughed in the plumbing and got the slab all poured. So um, he's still got to take off for him some other things. But the way the way it's going to go now is that we'll pay all the outstanding bills, see how much money we have left, and at the same time I'm going to be contract contact contract contacting um, <coughs> framers to get an estimate to frame it up and weather it in, and then we'll look at how much it's going to cost versus how much we have and then try to narrow that gap and then get them to frame it up. Once they get it framed up and weathered in, piece of cake after that. Did I say that, Bruce? Yeah. That was say. It'll be easier anyway. All right, Dan's gonna come lead us in a song. Let's stand together, turn to 235, 235. <laughs> to get very far from Calvary, to remember all that you accomplished on the cross for us. And Lord, 
uh, your burial and your resurrection, Lord, is the heart of our faith. And so, Lord, help us not to stray far away from that, we pray. Ask now that you bless this next few minutes. Be with Colton, Lord. Uh, give him clarity of thought and speech and the Holy Spirit power as he opens the word to us this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Good morning, everyone. I see everybody survive the wind. The tree didn't. Good to see everybody. If you have a Bible with you, please open to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. I, about a month ago after I'd given the last sermon, God had already put on my heart what I wanted to, what He rather wanted to, me to preach on today, and it just kept running through my mind, and even through that time of saying, well, God, is, is this something you would like me to preach on? He just kept saying, yes. <laughs> and so today's title is actually The Voice of God. We are in 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're going to be starting in verse 9. There, and this is Elijah we're speaking of here, but there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, the sound of a low whisper, and when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And when Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meloha, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Abba, Father, God, we thank you again just for another day that we can be here, listen to your word, Father, that you have given us your word. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, that we have here in our country a written word that we can just freely get, Father. We can go and grab, we can read, and Lord, today I ask and pray that you would teach us from your word by the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would teach us, Lord, and help me to be concise and clear with what you've put on my heart as I share with everyone here. Father, I pray that in this time, Lord, it would be a learning moment, if anything, Father, but a challenge to us to question and see, Lord, what the voice of God really is. And Lord, we give the honor and glory for it all. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. The voice of God. See, we're reading here in 1 Kings chapter 19 
It's an amazing thing. We find that Elijah had just, this is right after Elijah had taken down the prophets of Baal. Right after that, Jezebel sends a messenger to him and says, I'm going to kill you. Now, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but suffice it to say that's exactly what she tells him. And he gets frightened. He runs away. And in the midst of him running, he comes to the mount. And as he stays here, it says 40 days and 40 nights, by the way. A voice comes to him asking what's going on. Why is he here? And then it instructs him to go out of the cave and go search for God. Here in 1 Kings chapter 19, you'll find that there is a great calamity that precedes God's presence. However, it isn't in the display of the power that you hear God. It's actually the loud or the loud and awesome signs and wonders. It's actually God's words comes within a thin layer of silence, or as God's word says, a whisper. Something I take from this text as I was reading it is, it says, Behold, the Lord passed by, and what proceeds from his presence is the showing of an awesome procession that announces that God is there. Sometimes I think we forget that even amongst the greatest of calamities, God is behind it all. Sometimes when we're sitting in the middle of our storm, we forget that that's just God saying, I'm here. It's hard to think that amongst even the bad things that are happening, that God allows them in our lives. Why? To gain our attention. See, when things come into our lives, when we're shaken and stirred, when we're unsure of what direction to go, when things get more calamitous and unsure, we need to remember that that's God's presence. He's stirring something in our lives. He's making us pay attention to Him. Or at least that should be the focus. See, when God allows those things in our lives, it's to gain our attention and to get us to become more aware and search for Him. Notice how Elijah here in the text goes out of the cave. He wraps himself up and he begins to look. And he sees all of these things, but it says in each and every one, God was not in them. And see, but it's not the storms of life that he just necessarily speaks in. See, it's actually after the dust settles, and there's a moment of silence in the storm that Elijah hears God's voice, a small whisper. It's important for us to remember that. Why? Because we oftentimes think that it's God should be loud in our lives, that God should just be apparent, that God should be... And it's not that we can't go and look in nature and see the great things that He has made and see Him in His presence. But what I'm talking about today isn't His presence. I'm talking about the voice of God. How do I hear His voice? And oftentimes where we think it should be something loud and ever-present, and a lot of people assume that, well, God should speak to me. He does. And we're going to find out today how that is. First thing we find it is, again, in a within normally within a whisper. Matthew 6, verse 5 and 6. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the secret corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, the context here is simply to say, don't be like other people and try to be a showboat. Right? right? That's really Christ here is warning his disciples and others, don't go out and just pray these lengthy prayers to make them say how awesome you are. That's what the Pharisees were doing in this time. But there is something important to glean from this. He says, go and pray in secret. Many times we find Christ during his ministry. If you read through the Gospels, he does something pretty profound. He does pray publicly. He does, does give public blessings. 
But a lot of times during his journey, he goes and takes time to go to the wilderness. He takes time to go into the quiet place to talk with God. And see, God speaks to us in the quiet places of our lives. It's when we set aside the time and place, a holy place and a time, that we are showing our hearts and seeking Him. See, we oftentimes think that, well, I'm so busy in my life, I should just take this opportunity to pray. And it's not that that's a bad thing, but we ought to take the time to set a place, to set a time away to go in quiet closure with Him and Him alone. God's Word talks about how there are prayer closets. A lot of people in the Old Testament would go to their roof and had a specific little place that they would even pray to God there. And what's, again, I, it comes to mind a little bit when we talk about Daniel. Remember, they tried to trip him up. They knew the one thing that they could get Daniel on was his faithfulness to God. And they said the only thing that they get him on is that he prays every day. And even when they made a law that he ought not to consult anybody else but Nebuchadnezzar, he still was faithful. He didn't pray in front of a window because he wanted everybody to see that he was disobeying. You know, he did it because he was always faithful to God. That was his place, his quiet place that he went to to pray to God. What's important for us to remember is during the calamities of our life, during the storms of our life, God will speak to us when we take the time to say, God, I need you. And we take that time to say, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to come before you. Whether that's on your bed, kneeling before your bed, or like we do in the mornings here in, in prayer when we set time to pray you know, on, on the chairs even. It doesn't matter where you're at. It just matters that you're taking time with God. The fact of the matter is when I take time to God in prayer, that's when He most often speaks to us. It may not be immediately. It may not be in the way you want Him to speak. But the fact is, if you want God to speak in your life, we have to take time. That's the most important prayer. You say, but I want Him to speak to me audibly. I want Him to speak to me so I can hear, so I know, and I've been there. As a young Christian growing into maturity, I am oftentimes thought, I want him to just tell me what to do. You miss the point. We'll get into that in a moment. But you do miss the point. If you come to a place and you say, I just want God to tell me. Well, he does. Just not in the way you probably thought or wanted. Problem is, this is the God of the universe. The one who spoke it all in a creation with his very words. The problem with him speaking to you directly out loud for us all to hear right now is if he were to, go read what happened when he did that with the Israelites. It says that when he started to speak at Mount Sinai, that the earth trembled, the rock shook, and the trees by his very voice began to splinter apart. Now imagine with me for a moment that scene. That you don't see anything, you hear his voice. And his voice alone has the power to tremble the earth and tree splinter. I don't know about you, but I've never seen the noise that loud. Where it just splinters the trees. I can imagine the Israelites, as they say how fearful they are, covering their ears because they can barely handle his presence and his voice alone. Again, this is the very voice that when Christ was asked, Are you he? Are you the Messiah? And he says, I am. The scriptures tell us the men around him fell down. If God were to speak to us audibly today, we couldn't handle it. Amen. This is the God of the universe. So he speaks to us quietly. And you ask, why? Why would God speak to me in such a way quietly? Well, it's actually done because if, you've, if you're a father or a mother and you've ever done this before, but you start to speak in a whisper and the kids go, I can't hear you, and you just keep going and they get closer to you. And eventually as they get closer, it's just so you can really just be close with them. 
I believe when you read in the Scripture, God speaks to us quietly because He wants us to search for Him. Sure, He could choose to speak to us audibly, but we couldn't stand it. In fact, we probably would live in constant fear. But God doesn't want us just to live in fear. He wants us to, to live in a way that we love and we search for Him. And so He speaks mostly in a whisper, quietly, in a way that we have to Go to Him and get closer. When I draw to Him, He draws near to me. He also speaks through His Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, <laughs> These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual, or interpreting spiritual truths in spiritual language. We find here in our scripture that God speaks and teaches very much mostly through His Spirit. See, it's the Holy Spirit, those of us who have Christ, that He teaches, that He comforts, that He comes to us through. How many times in my own life where I should be sad, and I am sad, and I'm grieving, and I pray, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, God, I don't know what to do. And then for those of you maybe who have experienced this, it's almost like a, a, a blanket, uh, like a hug comes over you. And you feel none of the sadness that you did before. And it's unexplainable, except through what the Scripture tells us is the Holy Spirit. An amazing thing is, too, when it happens, you know that it's God. And see, God speaks through His Spirit. Another way is we find, and this really is the main way, God speaks through His Word. Amen. God speaks through what we call the Bible through, there's a reason why it's called God's Word. Hebrews, because it is. Because it is. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Scripture, or the Bible... It's called God's Word because it speaks to us directly. And it does something powerful and transformative. Amen. And those of us who know Christ, who have read God's Word, and I'm assuming it's everybody in here this morning, but the point is we all know this to be the fact that when we take time in God's Word, it does something that no other book can ever do, no other self-help book can do. Well, if I go and open up a self-help book, self book today, what I find is it's just me trying to follow these guidelines and these things, and then I fail at it every single time anyway. Even the one that says, you know, computing for dummies, uh, most of the ones for dummies, they don't work out very well for me anyway. But the point, <laughs> but I find that this book is for dummies. God's Word is for everyone. doesn't matter who you are. If it, and just to see the transformative power, if you didn't have enough examples in God's Word, when you start to read it, all of a sudden, He transforms you. He speaks to you. And what's amazing, why does it say that it's living and active? 
It's just a book, right? It's just, it's just words. Like, sure, I can, they're great, and I can live by them, and, and there's great you know, things I can glean from it, but how in the world is it living and active? How is it that God's Word says that it's breathed out? It's living because when we aren't even trying to bring Scripture to mind, an amazing thing happens. God brings Scripture to mind. God brings Scripture before us that we may have not even been aware of or even remembered. I know in my own life, I'll be lost for a moment in whatever situation I have, and all of a sudden you see Scripture coming up into mind. I didn't bring that to mind. I don't have that capacity. (laughs) But God does. God speaks to us through His Word. That's why it's so important for not just us, but for others for your children, for your family. That's why devotion time is important for your kids. That's why it's important for the kids, by the way, to really understand, even at a young age. Trust me, I deal with the teens all day long. It doesn't seem like things are getting through to them. They'll sit there. And if they're not staring at you, they're probably staring elsewhere. I find, though, that it's when they're quiet that they're probably listening. It's when they're not responsive and not talking that they're probably listening. But by the way, it doesn't matter whether they're not listening or not. It's important that they should. But as I have come to find out that really the importance is that we plant the seed. And when the seed and the word of God is implanted on their hearts and other people's hearts, kids, grown-ups, adults, saved, unsaved, God's Word does something amazing. It might not be right there in front of you that you see that transformation or you see that... By the way, that's the point. You're not God. It's not meant for you to use as a tool in that way. It's for God to use when He deems it to be used. And so what I find here is here's this living Word that when I give it out to other people and dispense of it, somehow God uses that even later down in life. There are things as an adult now that when I was a child, that scripture that was taught to me, that all of a sudden I just remember way down like now, talking 20 years ago. And I'm sitting here going, wow. And then I have to think of the faithfulness of the person who gave me that word and then glorify God and the faithfulness that he had, number one, to give me that person in life, and then number two, that he would bring scripture like that into my heart, into my forethoughts of my mind, and it shows how much love and comfort. And again, God speaks through three main ways. We see that God speaks in a whisper. He speaks in the quiet times in prayer and contemplation. He speaks through His Spirit, and He speaks through His Word. Now the question, though, is when does He speak, though? When does He speak? Look back at our text of 1 Kings chapter 19. He chose to speak when all was quiet. See, there are times when God will choose to speak when the storms of life are most tremendous and speaking as Jesus did when He told the wind and waves, peace be still. There are times where God chooses to come into our life, interrupt whatever is happening, just so that he, because He knows us, And he knows the situation. He knows that if he didn't intercede, that we probably would fall. See, the thing is, I think we talked about this in the men's meeting yesterday. We try to take the place of God and his mind, his thoughts, his plans, and we know nothing. And it's not our intention to know that. It shouldn't be. It's not our place. When he chooses to speak, he comes at at the right time. What he chooses to speak about, it may be during the calamity of the time to say, stop. So you have a break. But oftentimes I have found, and I know this in my own life, when I have had calamity, when I have had problems, when I have come to the end of my rope, that it's only until afterwards that he chooses to speak. And you have to ask yourself, why? But I needed you then. Again, remember, go back to the beginning of our scripture. You forget that his presence is already there. But why would he continue to hold out, as it were, and not come to me when I call for him right now? The answer, again, is going back to like a father who wants his child to draw closer just so they can whisper in their ear, I love you. He wants to draw you so close that you have to grab on with everything you have. 
See, the reason why I have found, and I'm mostly preaching to myself today, that when you are at your just ends meet, you don't know what else to do, and you've been grabbing on and grabbing on, and you're like, God, where are you? And it almost seems like the dust has settled. Yeah, then he speaks. Then there's something to be taught. Then there's something he wants to say. But again, God speaks ultimately when he chooses and at the perfect time and moment. And any time that he has spoken in my life, and I think we all can say the same, it's always been, maybe not at the time I wanted, but it was at the time I needed it. Because God is good. Genesis chapter 15 and chapter 17. See, Abraham was told by God, what? That he would have a baby. That he was going to give him a baby. Then we get to chapter 17, but there was silence for 13 years of Abraham's life. Exodus chapter 24, Moses had to wait six days in silence until God would speak to him after commanding Moses to go and meet with him. Six days. It's not 13 years. But let's be honest, when I'm in trouble and I'm waiting for God's instructions, a couple days, even an hour, may seem like an eternity. Why? Why? See, God speaks to us at the time He chooses. I want to choose somebody else here in 1 Samuel chapter 10, somebody who was told something by God, had some silence, and I have a point to make with all of this, but Samuel gives Saul instruction from God to wait seven days until he would come to Saul and his armies to show them what to do next. But by chapter 13, Saul waits the seven days and panics and says, well, Samuel's not showing up. Let's just do it. If he would have waited just a little longer, says by the time he finished with the sacrifices that he was told to wait on, at the exact time that he was just wrapping that up, Samuel shows up and says, what have you done? And he lost the kingdom forever. Samuel pronounced by God's word saying, this would have been yours, but you didn't obey. Something simple. What's the point that I'm making here? See, the question is, I haven't heard from God in a long time, maybe. Or I don't know what direction. Maybe you've come to the end of a line somewhere in your life, and you're like, I don't know what to do. And I'm hearing silence from him. Again, remember Moses at the Red Sea. They come before. He did exactly as God instructed. Comes before, and everybody goes, what do we do now? See, when God speaks... You follow the last thing he said and just trust in him. See, when God speaks to us, sometimes it's not always as a continuous thing. I've heard Christians, and maybe that's true, and and they're blessed in that way, I I would, you know, I suppose, that God has told me to do this, and God has told me to do that, and God has told me here, and it seems like they've instructed them every which way. Okay, but there's a lot of us, I think, that we've had times in our life where God instructed me to do this, and I reached to that point, And now I'm sitting here and I don't know what to do. In those times, you know what you do? You wait and you trust. You wait and you trust until he gives direction, gives a web window, until he you know his voice when he his signs, when he puts something out in front of you to say, Now I know to move. Because when we don't follow his last instruction, when we don't follow the last thing he said we end up falling into calamity, just like Saul did. Now the question isn't just how does he speak, when does he speak, but who does he speak to? John chapter 10, verse 27 and 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. See, God's voice is known by His children, His sheep. When we hear the voice of God, we know that it is Him, whether audibly or by His Spirit within us or the Scriptures. And we know that to be true. Those of us who have heard the voice of God one way or shape or form or the other, whether it's through the Scripture whether maybe it is within, within you, you hear through the Spirit. You know it's Him. Why? Why? You can't really answer that, can you? 
but you know it's him. You know it's his voice. And it's an amazing thing because only his children know his voice. Let's share a little bit of a testimony here, but when I was, I never really thought, you know, I thought most people who would say, I, I heard God speak to me. I kind of thought, eh. <laughs> I don't think that's how he speaks to people. I don't. But I can't say that. Not that he just comes to people and he speaks in the way and, you know, that now we have more scripture. I, not in the new age apostle junk that there is today. But God does come to us. He does speak, again, he speaks to you through scripture. Who else? Those are his words. When they bring them up to your heart and to your mind, when you're at a place and you're like, I don't, what do I do? By the, again, just through the preaching of his word, how many times have you found that it seems like the scriptures from one message to the next hour seem to match up? That nobody communicates that. It's got to be coincidence. <laughs> it happens almost every week. It's got to be coincidence. No, it's God working and speaking. See, he ultimately has control of all of it. And if we are sensitive to his voice and we obey it, amazing things happen. It's a testimony to his word, to his faithfulness, to his love, to his power. That's the God we have. He doesn't have to speak. In fact, he could, again, speak audibly to us and we could barely handle it. But he chooses to speak to us in a very different way. And it glorifies his name, I think, even more. It does. Again, using the example, when we preach and then in the first service, it seems to match the second half. It's almost like here's the first chapter, now we're going to the second chapter. And nobody got together to speak about it. I can be over in the classroom and guess what? The same exact verses that I never talked to anybody about, about my lesson, matches exactly what the scripture was in the next one. That's God. That was God speaking to us. And you say, how do I know it's his voice? When it's scripture, I know it's him. A testimony I have is there was a time in my life where I had, did not know what to do. I was at the Red Sea in my life. And I thought I was going to drown. And I remember being on my hands and knees and crying and, and just saying, God, I don't know what to do. I don't. I know you know what to do. And I, I simply need you. I don't know where I go. And I remember specifically asking in, in all of this, and again, not being quiet, just talking and rambling, but thank God he's patient. <laughs> but I, I said, God, will it ever be over? And I, as clear as day, heard soon in my heart. Soon. And the reason I know it's him is because as God's word says, we know his voice. I know his voice because when it was said, I was comforted. Not in a way where I was imagining it. Not in the way that I was sitting there contemplating it. But in a way, and I know for those who know Christ and have him in your hearts, you've heard that still small voice in times of trouble, in times of great joy, and a great joy and a great comfort come across you. Just as when Daniel had, when he was spoken, said, fear not. And John, by the way, the one whom Jesus loved the most, he likes to point that out to us a lot. In Revelations, when Christ is before him and he can't recognize him and he fell down in fear, the only way he got up is because Christ came up to him and said, fear not. For you are loved. John 8, 47. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason you do not hear them is because you are not of God. Which is leading to the last point here. You can only hear God's voice, really, if you're a Christian. You have to have Christ in you, the Holy Spirit within you, to hear his voice. And that's not to say that he can't reach you. That's not to say that there's not something there. In fact, all in the world, in some way, shape, or form, can hear his voice. How so? 
Romans 2, 14 through 16, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. It's implied here when you see that they can't hear him very directly. You can't hear him like Christians can. Again, you can't hear his voice and know his voice if you are not of his flock. But there's a remnant of the original plan, the law written on every heart in the world. Some people are just so hardened that they can't hear what's right and wrong. Why is it that when we talk about morality, everybody wants to argue that, well, everybody knows morality. It's a basic thing. Even unsafe people, yeah, killing's wrong. It's something inside of them that knows it. And God's word tells us it's because God is still there. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The problem is, again, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, you really don't have that relationship. I am lost. There's a lot of things that go around me and I don't understand them. There's a lot of things that I see and they're wicked and they're evil and I don't know how to navigate through them. I know that these things are wrong. I know what I'm doing is wrong. I know in some way, and maybe you don't necessarily agree with everything in God's Word, but there's a reason for that. It's because you're lost. It's because even though you do have that still small voice in you saying what's right and wrong, you have seared, your conscience is seared. You are not of His flock. He can't, he hasn't transformed you because you're not, he's not within you. But he does say that I am at the door, and if I'm there and I'm knocking today, will you take me in? So we learned some things here in closing. When we're at trouble, or even in the joys of our life, we need to take time to be with God, to set aside in prayer. That's how God speaks to us. He speaks to us in prayer. He speaks to us through His Spirit. And He speaks to us through His Word. And when He chooses to speak to us, that's up to Him. He's God. Amen. But an amazing thing, when He does speak to us, it's transformative. Amen? Right. It's transformative. And if you don't know Christ today, I pray that today would be that day that if you hear that voice, that you would allow Him to be transformed in your life. And maybe you are a child of His, and there's things He's working on in your life, and He's speaking to you now and during the week and the last month, and He's, say, he's trying to say something into you, but you are avoiding it. Don't do it. He has a way, of, if you avoid His voice, of making things happen so you have to pay attention. Again, go back to our scripture. He will make calamities happen so that you pay attention. But remember that even amongst them, His presence is still there. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you again just for the opportunity, Lord, just to speak what you put on my heart. Father, you have always been there for us. Lord, even when we were still sinners, Lord, you loved us. God, you continuously shout your presence, your glory, and nature, Lord, and everything around us, as it's said time and time again, as Brother Lannon has said, that you have to crawl over the cross, literally crawl over your love to go to hell. And Lord, I am thankful, Lord, that you brought my attention towards you. Father, I pray and ask, Lord, that you would help us to be attentive to you, God, more. Help us, Lord, to be careful and attentive, to take time to hear your voice, to take time in prayer, to take time to listen to your spirit, Lord, to take time in Scripture so that it may live inside of us and our hearts and our minds, transform us continuously, and, Lord, that we, too, may dispense of your word and so that, too, may be work in other people's lives and hearts. And Father, Help us, Lord, if there's anyone here today who is maybe going through a time and trial in their life where they say, I need you, God. Please help me, direct me. Help them, Lord, to hold on and just wait until the time you speak to them. Help us to remember that you speak to us in 
certain times, but ultimate, Lord, it's just when you choose. But Father, give hope to them as when you do, we know that a great peace and comfort comes over us. And we can be sure when we know your voice because we're your children. But Father, ultimately, if there's anyone here that does not know you today, I pray that today they would open their hearts, the door of their hearts to you. They listen to that small voice and say, I want that. I want to hear you. I want to see, Lord, what is transforming the lives of the people here around me. But Father, that you would ultimately transform their heart the same as you have mine. And Father, we give you the honor and glory for it all. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You were dismissed.